And from Ariana in Anchorage, Alaska. Ariana, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. Um, in my school, there's some of the children, parents, don't let their kids go to um, science class if the teacher teaches extensively in evolution. And I'm wondering if you have a comment on that. Hmm. Well, I better restrain myself, I suppose. Uh, um, I, I think it's a form of mental child abuse uh, by the parents on the children. I think that, um, that parents don't own their children, and there are limits to the rights that parents have over their children's minds. I think, it, it, to, to really echo something I said in answer to the last question, it would be equivalent to parents not allowing their children to go to geography class because the geography teacher taught that the world was round. And so I, I do think it's, it's a very bad thing. I think that there are limits to the freedom that parents ought to be allowed to have to brainwash their children. Ariana, thank, thank you for that call. You're welcome. Very interesting. Um, yes. In, uh, um, well, all right. Uh, let's, let's take another call now from Patrick in Shepherdsville, uh, Kentucky, I guess that is. Patrick, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for taking my call. Uh -huh. uh, Dr. Dr. Dawkins, I think you're brilliant. Um, my question is, um, if you're aware of the popularity of YouTube clips of your show, The Root of All Evil, and uh, specifically the Teapot Atheist clip, and if you could perhaps explain that. I'm a Reformed agnostic. I'm now firmly an atheist because partially uh, of your, uh, your books and your videos. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. You didn't, you um, didn't pay him in advance, did you? <laughs> um, I was vaguely aware that that um, television program called Root of All Evil, which I should stress, by the way, was not my title. Um, I don't think religion is the root of all evil. Uh, I think it's the root of quite a lot of evil, but it's not a very catchy title, and I'm, I lost my fight with Channel 4. I tried to fight against that title. You ask about the teapot story. Um, the teapot story was one that was invented by the great philosopher Bertrand Russell um, to counter the point that people very often make when they say well you can't disprove God and I actually mentioned this earlier in connection with Francis Collins you cannot disprove God and so some people take that to mean that therefore the likelihood of God's existing is about equal to the, to the likelihood that he doesn't exist, a kind of 50-50, you can't prove it either way you can't prove he does exist, you can't prove that he, that he does and so that he, you can't prove he does and you can't prove that he doesn't, so it's like tossing a coin. I don't think it is like tossing a coin, and Bertrand Russell's teapot story illustrates that. He says, suppose I were to tell you that there is a large China teapot in orbit around the sun, uh, which you can't see with telescopes because it's too small. You cannot disprove the teapot, but that doesn't mean that you should regard the likelihood of the teapot existing as equal to the likelihood that it doesn't exist. Nobody in their right mind believes that there is a large China teapot orbiting the sun. Uh, there's no positive reason why they should believe it, and exactly the same is true of God. That is a, seemed to me to be an absolute knockdown reply to the statement, oh, well, you can't disprove God, therefore you might as well believe him as likely as not. So I guess the flying spaghetti monster is a sort of a modern incarnation of that argument. It, it, exactly. It's a, it's, a, it's a modern incarnation of Russell's teapot. Right. And just for people who don't know, the flying spaghetti monster was, I guess, started, a, I mean, maybe it's serious, but I guess it was started as a lark uh, against people who thought that uh, there was a god controlling the universe. Yes, I, I presume it was started for the same reason as Russell's teapot, and a lot of people who claim to have been touched by his noodly appendage. Right, and, and I have to say, I learned from your book that there's now a reform movement of the... A reform, move, a reform flying first. spaghetti monster movement, uh, which is in conflict with the orthodox flying spaghetti monster movement, <laughs> right. yes. A great schism. <laughs> Let's thank you for the American pronunciation, by the way. Um, let's take one more call. Todd in uh, Smithsville, Missouri. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dawkins, I look forward to, to getting your book and reading it. Um, I'm always fascinated by these discussions. I personally am at least a theist and probably a deist. I'm a man of great faith, but certainly have a disenchantment with organized religion as it is now. But um, I was thinking more from an anthropological standpoint that early civilizations, before they knew about a god, created their own religions out of an innate human need to create understanding about the world about them. 
because I, I cynically believe that everybody believes what makes them most comfortable. And so in looking for answers, do we as human beings have an innate need to just create these things? Well, I, that looks very plausible to me, and you're perfectly right that anthropologists have described um, religious beliefs from tribes all around the world. They, they vary in detail, but they have a, a lot of general things in common. Your idea that people believe what they find comfortable, well, I'm afraid it's all too plausible. I, I, don't, I can't really empathize with it because um, I can't understand why anybody would think that just because something is comforting, that makes it true. I mean, there are all sorts of things that I would like to be true, but unfortunately, it's just tough. They're not. And uh, so I don't really understand why people take that line, though I, I think you're probably right that they do. I'm a little curious why, in view of what you've just said, you are yourself a believer. Uh, I'm afraid he's no longer on the line. Oh, okay, but, fine. Uh, we'll ask him the next time, but uh, in the meantime, I'll invite others to call. We're speaking with Richard Dawkins, uh, professor at Oxford University and the author of a new book, The God Delusion. I'm Joe Palka, and this is Talk of the Nation from NPR News. What, one of the things that I, I wanted to speak to ask you about is... Uh, I think what happens a lot of the time in this question of is there something uh, that's uh, the invisible hand behind things is is there are so many, and, and I'm going to use this word purposefully, miraculous things that happen in biology, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, getting potassium ions to flow through a membrane wall when the sodium ions are excluded and the sodium ions are smaller, or whether it's something far more uh, sophisticated uh, or that, that you can go from a fertilized egg to an entire human being without a significant enough number of mistakes to have our arms attached to our heads or something like that. And so the word I would say is miraculous, and I think uh, what happens is people have a hard time accepting the fact that such a remarkable thing can happen, not by chance, as you point out, but, but through a selection process that would have eventually gotten to this point. And my thesis, and you can knock it down if you like, is that people have a really hard time understanding extremely big numbers. Because what this, all the things that led to these events are small occurrences, lower probability occurrences, but they could occur. And when you start talking about things that could occur, if you're talking on the scope of billions of years, then you begin to think that things could occur, that could occur, do occur. Well, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. That's very interesting. Um, I think the argument that... Um, even very, very improbable things, given enough billions of years, if, if they could occur, they, they will. That's an argument which I would use not actually for uh, the details of biological organization like potassium and sodium ions and things. I would use that for uh, possibly the origin of life, the, the event in the primeval soup that led to the first self-replicating molecule. I have made a case that that could have been a genuinely very, very, very improbable event, possibly the sort of Im event so improbable that it occurs on only, say, one in a billion planets. And there are so many billions of planets in the universe that it has to have happened on some of them, and here we are sitting on one of them, so it had to be ours. Now, that's an argument I'd use for the origin of life. I would not use that argument for the so-called miraculous things that you perceive in the details of life, uh, things like eyes and hemoglobin molecules and sodium pumps in the nervous in in in, in nerves and things mm -hmm. of that sort, um, because natural selection is actually Darwinian natural selection is not of that character. It's not one of those things where it's very 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 improbable, but there have been enough billions of years for it to happen. It's not actually all that improbable. Each step of evolution is not particularly improbable. What is improbable is the accumulated result of many, many, many steps in evolution added together in cascade. When you look at something really remarkably beautifully apparently designed, what you've called miraculous, I think it's an unfortunate word, something like a nerve cell, that is the end product of a very large number of cumulative steps of evolution, giving rise to what seems to be a very improbable result. Dr. Dawkins, I committed the unforgivable sin of asking a very complicated question without enough time, but I'll have to quickly thank you and encourage people, if they want to learn more about your opinions, to get your book, The God Delusion. Thanks for joining us today.